Okay, so now we continue our discussion of monetary policy. Yesterday we had a great discussion with former presidents of central banks from around the world, um, underlined the importance of expectations of inflation as well as the dynamics and the importance of using models in forming uh, those views about uh, inflation. So today, uh, we have uh, a paper by Ivan Guernic that dips deeper into these issues and tries to give some more insights into the formation of expect expectations of inflation and the path through into inflation by comparing, using and comparing two very well-known models, uh, Guillermo's, so famously known as the sticky price model, and uh, John Taylor's staggered contract model. So Ivan, uh, of course, as you all know, um, is the uh, solo professor at MIT, and uh, he will uh, have 35 minutes to present his paper, followed by comment by Andy Neumeyer, who, of course, is also a very influential economist at uh, uh, working at Universidad Torquato di Tela, but also uh, one of the reasons, I mean, the other one, of course, is uh, Martin Uribe, for having all of us here today. So thank you to both, and uh, Ivan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Liliana, and um, it's, a, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Um, I mean, for, for honoring Guillermo, and for all the attendees here, um, I would say, you know, I'm Argentine. For me, Guillermo is like Maradona. You know, we, uh, maybe Messi also. <laughs> so I really feel like I don't know. I was touched by the Calvo Ferry, and that's why I'm here. You know, so sort of a, you know, an amazing thing. So, um, and I'll have a little more to say later. But um, let me tell you what this paper is. I, I view this as a kind of myth-busting paper. Um, and what's the myth? The myth is something like this, uh, that when we think, and this is very stylized, um, that, you know, so the thing I want you to focus on here is this is an equation for inflation, and the idea is that inflation expectations will move inflation one for one, okay? And this type of thinking is really embedded in, 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 in eco among economists and policymakers, and I want to say that that that's not completely right. I feel like I was also brainwashed into thinking this way, and it was very liberating to realize that uh, you know we don't have to necessarily uh, that you know we have to think about harder about this. Okay, so the point of this paper is to, is to kind of think harder about what is the actual pass through, and I'll call it pass through from inflation expectations causally into inflation. Okay, and. Um, and that's, I think, highly relevant. You know, in policy, you hear, let's say, when uh, in 2021, maybe it was used to say, we don't have to worry. Inflation expectations are well anchored, and they're so important that we don't have to worry about it, um, about inflation going up. And then it was also used later to say, you know, we really have to raise rates because inflation expectations can get out of hand. And it, I think it was used as a boogeyman, so to speak, in that sense. Um, and I want to kind of, you know, question that, all right? So the way I'm going to proceed, and I could talk about empirical evidence if you ask a question at the end uh, and tell you why I don't think it settles it, uh, the question. Uh, the current evidence is always difficult, so I have a slide on that. If you have ask questions at the end about that, I'll show you. Um, but the way I'm going to approach this is to think about uh, some models. So there are some, you know, uh, standard models, Calvo, Taylor, <coughs> and more generally other time-dependent models and some state-dependent models that we use to think about inflation. And I'm gonna go through those models. So this, this is kind of the opposite of Fernando's paper. You know, it's like there, there's one model, it's hard, and you work it out. Okay, this is more, it's gonna be very easy once you, so here the big thing for me was to ask the question in a certain way. And there was a certain perspective, after that it was all downhill, all right? And contrary, and the, the truth is, I don't know what the right model is, so I'll show you what different models say, okay? And a little bit, my message is we all don't know. We have to be humble. So let's figure out first 
what the theory actually says, and then maybe we can work out, narrow it down, okay? Uh, so that's going to be the spirit. So what I'm going to do is something very simple. I'm going to look at the optimal pricing and aggregate it and think about inflation there and think about varying, you know, understand the causal effect of inflation expectations by allowing for any arbitrary inflation expectation. Okay, so I'm going to depart from rational expectations in that way. Um, and what I'm going to be using is a temporary equilibrium notion that's often used in the learning literature. And I learned it uh, from, from Mike Woodford, uh, from a nice paper with uh, uh, Garcia. Um, and basically, the idea is, you know, I'll be able to solve an equilibrium for whatever expectations people have at, the, at a moment in time. And you, then you can slap on your favorite model of expectations. So this is going to be a cartridge you, ed, everyone can use. It's a chip that, you know, you can use with any kind of uh, model of inflation expe of expectations that you want. Maybe you want to put rational expectations. Maybe you want to put some adaptive, some learning expectations, et cetera. All right. And the kind of num things I'm, I'll be talking about is kind of like that first slide. I'm going to say, first, I'll start with something simple where people have kind of a, they think inflation is going to be constant at some rate. So there's some number, pi e. And I want to tell you what, how that translates into pi. And I'm going to be linearizing, so it's just going to be a coefficient. So I'll be talking about that phi there. And then there's going to be other stuff that I could talk about, but I won't. You know, how, what's happening with the output gap and all that stuff. I want to, I'm going to set that aside and look at what's happening just uh, with inflation expectations. And then later I'll do something more elaborate and give you a full Phillips curve so we can break down in particular, you know, is it short run expectations of inflation that matters or, 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 or long expectations? I'm going to break that down for you, okay? And I'm also going to show you the role of past inflation. All right, so just to fix ideas, uh, like Fernando's doing this kind of shock. There's a shock to marginal cost, and then you look at what happens with prices. And a lot of the literature on exchange rates, pass-through, and et cetera, do the same thing, okay? A permanent shock in levels. The kind, so almost what I'm doing is just an, an exercise that hadn't been done, I think, of doing this kind of shock. No, we had, you know, we changed the slope instead. Okay, and other than that, it's very simple. So you'll see that, that you know, you know, once you, you you figure out how you want to ask this question, it's like you know, solving it was like a, a problem, you know, easier than a problem set. You know, all right. So this is kind of the black box I'm going to have for expectations of inflation, and my job is to go from there causally to price setters. I won't talk about wage setters, but everything is analogous. Okay, so I think there's a lot of things you would learn about wage setting as well here. And then to inflation, okay? And I think it's always good in a talk to say what you do and you don't do. What I'm not gonna do is tell you how ex you know, expectations are formed. And there might be a feedback there between what's happening and, and how they're formed, okay? That's gonna motivate that I'm gonna tell you what's happening at a moment in time given inflation expectations and I won't emphasize too much like the dynamics after, after many periods will happen, because at that point I might need to model you know, the formation of expectations. Okay? But like I said, what I'm going to do is going to be useful for whatever model you might want to bring to the table on those expectations and how they're formed. What I'm also going to not do is look at all the, the other aspects of a macro model. So I'm just going to focus on that uh, price setting uh, condition. All right, and what are my contributions? The first is to ask this question and compute a simple pass-through measure. I don't think it had been done, okay, that fee. So um, the temporary equilibrium had been used, and there's things like that in, in the learning literature, but no one had said, okay, let's isolate this pass-through. Let's look at it. What is it? And then I'm going to also explore a much wider range of models. Uh, say the learning literature is doing all the, a lot of work in modeling expectations, but then they stick to something very simple like Calvo pricing, okay? And instead, I want to explore a bunch of other uh, models. And then I'm going to uh, also be able to tell you about this short versus long run expectation. So those are the contributions. So let me jump right into it and start with a couple of different models. So I'll start with Calvo first. And I'm going to argue there that the pass through is near one, basically. It's not one, but I'm going to approximate it by one. It's an excellent approximation to say that the pass through is one in the Calvo model. Okay? And so the, uh, and then Later, I'll do these other models and show you that it's not one, and it can be much lower in particular. Um, so let's start with the Calvo case. And in the Calvo case, I think people think it's one, but
But most people yeah, do, do not have a complete understanding of why it's near one. Okay, so they basically have it right for the wrong reasons. So let me first show you that. <laughs> okay, so basically we're after that fee. Um, and I'm going to hold everything else fixed. So my definition of that is I'm going to hold all the real marginal costs fixed. Okay? You can think in, the, in a general equilibrium setting, that's kind of like saying I'm holding employment in the future, and the whole path of employment in the future fixed. I'm not saying fixed constant. I'm saying the path of it. So I'm holding fixed what's happening on the real side. I want to focus on the nominal side on inflation expectations. And so that's what, that's what I mean by you know, all else fixed, all right? So I'm being very clear there. Um, and here's the wrong answer. Use the new Keynesian-Phillips curve to argue that phi is beta because you look at that equation and it looks like expectations enter. I mean, there's already something interesting that it's expectations of the future instead of today um, relative to the Lucas model. That's different. But roughly speaking, people look at that, say beta near one because I'm going to put 0.95 or something. So roughly speaking, uh, full, you know, full pass-through, I would say. But that's wrong, because we know we can also solve this inflation forward as a present value condition, as a present value of future output gaps. In which case, if I look at that equation, I would say phi is zero. Inflation expectations doesn't enter anymore. So which one is it? Okay. And the reality is, basically, you know, none of them are right. Okay, and the reason is with rational expectations, you've tied to the hip inflation expectations to future output gaps. So you can no longer think of the causal effect of inflation expectations alone. Okay, so in other words, because future output gaps matter per se, because they're going to affect real marginal costs and they're going to create inflation, you're kind of capturing the, the joint effect and you have not separated these, these effects. So in other words, this is the wrong answer. And let's look at the right answer. So a little bit of math, but it won't be, you won't need a mathematician for this one. Um, so here's the price setting condition in a standard Calvo model. Uh, I do something much more general in the paper, but let's stick with this. You're going to have a constant markup over a weighted average of your nominal uh, marginal cost. Okay? And the weights have to do with discounting and with the fact that with probability lambda, you're going to uh, keep your same price, so with probability 1 minus lambda, you're going to get a chance of a price change. Okay? This is the, the beautiful Calvo model that was you know, really a leap to saying let's use something recursive, something like dynamic programming. Okay? Um, so you get that. And now I'm just going to, you know, so I'm going to hold fix those MC, that little MC, which is real marginal cost. That sequence, I'm going to take it as given. So let me, as a first pass, just stuff it, that whole sequence and call that AT, okay? So AT is just that present value, weighted average of real marginal cost. I'm just going to set it aside. And I've just rewritten by subtracting the price index yesterday on both sides, okay? So I've been done much. And the other equation you have is that inflation is going to be, you know, P star, the, the price reset relative to the old price index, uh, times how many people are doing that, times the fraction of people that are changing their price. So if people are setting a higher price than the price index, there's positive inflation. If people who are getting to change their price are setting a price below the price index, there's deflation. That's all this equation is saying. So now I'm just going to combine both equations. But before I do, I, I want to do something simpler with that expectation of the price index. So I'm just going to model for now, and I'll relax this later, that people have an expectation of the price index that is going to be, you know, there's going to be a constant inflation rate, pi e. Okay? And this is just for simplicity so that we can talk about the pass-through. Later on, I'll do something more general. We'll have to talk about the coefficients, the, the pass-through coefficients. So combining these three equations, um, substituting this into the first, for instance, there, you just get that simple equation for the price setting. Okay? And you see there that if people have an inflation expectation that's positive, they will set a higher P star. They will set a higher price. Okay? And now plugging it into the second equation up there, you get what we wanted. We get what inflation, how inflation responds to inflation expectations with a coefficient phi. And the phi is just this uh, ratio of 1 minus lambda to 1 minus beta lambda, a very simple formula. Notice, it's not beta, okay? 
So we, we, we you know, the, the wrong answer doesn't work here. However, I'm just copying the formula up here. Let's think about this for a moment. So how different is this really? It can be quite different. So if you take lambda uh, towards uh, one, okay, so that means prices are very rigid, then phi goes to zero. Whereas if you looked at the New Keynesian model, you would still say it's beta, okay? So pass-through can be very, very low, theoretically speaking. You could also get a high pass-through by taking lambda towards zero or taking the discounting to zero, so basically taking beta to one, okay? So basically, theory doesn't say much here, even in Calvo. It can be anything. So it's not beta. It's not near one, necessarily. It can be anything, okay? However, let's, let's be realistic. Let's put a relevant range of parameters. So when you do put a relevant range of parameters, and it's pretty wide range of parameters, it's fair to say that you get a fee very near one. I'm not going to do that calculation, but basically the discounting is very low relative to uh, the frequency of price changes, okay? And so if you take the limit, uh, with that intuition in mind, if you take the limit of beta going to one, then you get a one here, okay? So intuitively, something near one is a very good approximation. So I'm going to actually sum this up as, as the Calvo model being a pass-through of one, okay? All right. Now let me talk about Taylor. And uh, Taylor Phelps, I guess, um, you know, uh, Taylor Phelps Fisher, okay? Um, those were models where you had a, 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 you know, a fixed calendar time between price changes. And I think that's much more realistic for a bunch of goods. Think of Netflix, Apple, et cetera, you know, rents. Um, so much of the data on price changes comes from supermarkets and then maybe things look very calvo, but so many goods, services, et cetera, uh, I think look a lot more like, like uh, Taylor, if we have to choose between the two, let's say. Okay, <laughs> redoing the calculations, but I won't bore you. Uh, just wanna you know, put them there so you see that it's very simple. We don't need uh, to do a lot of work. Sim we start with the similar two equations and we combine them. The bottom line is you get this formula for phi that is one half plus a term that I'm gonna ignore because it depends on n and n is kind of weird. Like I haven't told you how long a period is. And so I'm gonna do kind of like Fernando does often and this literature does often, work with continuous time. So I've done this in discrete time just to make it easier for people who don't like continuous time, but in, 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 in my philosophy is to take the limit of n to infinity, okay? And that captures that I'm literally thinking of a day, maybe a period, a week maybe, small, small amount of time, but that doesn't mean prices are very flexible because I get to choose how many periods uh, they're, they're stuck for, okay? So I can fix the ca amount of calendar time and I'm just splitting periods up uh, you know, very small pieces. I think that's the way to go because what I want to capture is that prices are very, uh, they're not coordinated. Everyone's changing prices at a, a different time of the day at a different day, okay? So that's, um, yeah, I can't remember the name for that. That's the asynchronous or whatever. It was in the title of Guillermo's paper. Um, when you do that, you get fee of a half. Oh, whoa, that's pretty big difference, right? Um, from one to a half just by switching to a model that I think applies to a lot more, you know, to a lot of goods, okay? So what's the intuition? Here's the intuition. If you have a Taylor model, and suppose that your marginal costs are going up like that, and let's ignore the markup just to make things simple. So then you want your price to be on average equal to your marginal cost. So if the marginal costs are following because of inflation, uh, this, this line, or that's what you think they're gonna follow, then you wanna set your price like the blue line so that on average it's right, okay? And, okay, so the key thing here is your observation is you're overshooting at the time that you're choosing the price, you're choosing a price that's higher than you wish you had, that, that you could. You know, if you could change prices every period, you would choose your prices to be on the black line. So in the first, in the period you're changing the price, you're choosing a price that's above your ideal price. And I'll call that an overshooting, okay, effect. All right. Now, what's the difference with Calvo? So Taylor's here, and Calvo instead has that your, your, your price might be set for a random amount of time, 
sometimes shorter than, so I'm going to do it so that on average it's the same in this figure. So let's do it kind of like the poor man's version of this. It's not exactly Calvo, but with half a probability you're going to get this spell, and with half a probability you're going to get that spell, and it averages up to the blue one. Okay, let's think of that case. And Calvo is similar, but it's exponentially distributed with a continuum of, of possible spells. But the intuition is, if you have this kind of randomness, then you, if you overshoot by the same amount as Taylor, there you regret it. You wish you had an overshot, because you had a short spell. Okay? On the other hand, if the spell goes on for too long, you regret not choosing an even higher price. Of course, you couldn't choose you know, a, 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 an overshoot that would stay contingent on what your spell was going to be. Okay? Um, by the way, when we look at the data, do we know? The firms don't know how long their spell is going to be? Maybe we do. Even, when, even if it looks on average like Kabul, maybe each period people know in advance how long it's going to be. So maybe it's a real... Okay, but that's a side note. But we have this, um, this problem then. You have to average out the two kinds of mistakes. But here's the thing. What you really care about is the total sum under uh, the discrepancy. So here you have a kind of tail risk. It's much worse. Okay, so intuitively, it's kind of quadratic in the deviation, okay? So you have this tail risk, and so you're going to weigh a lot more uh, the second mistake than the first. And so you're going to get a bigger overshoot with Calvo. That's the intuition I can give you with the little figure, okay? And that's what's producing more inflation uh, from inflation expectations in Calvo than in Taylor, okay? All right, so you have a bigger overshoot. Now let me show you a result for a general model of time-dependent pricing. So what I mean is <laughs> I'm going to think of Taylor and Calvo as two special cases that you firms have a hazard rate. Uh, so they wake up and they have some probability of changing their price as a function of how old their price is. So the Calvo case is that probability is constant. The Taylor case is that you have a zero probability for n periods and then you have a probability one after n periods. Okay, And you can fit a lot of things in between here, and, 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 and that's nice. The other thing I'm going to do is allow general production functions, general demands with strategic complementarities, general shocks to markups, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? I won't show you that in detail, but that's in the background. The key thing, though, is when you have this general hazard rate, there are really two densities we have to think about. One is the densities of completed spells. And that, what it means, what it represents, is that you maybe, uh, you know, you're serving uh, for uh, prices, and you check when a price was changed. When it was changed, you ask them how long it had been there before. Okay? So when a price is changed, you ask how long the previous price had been set for. So you write down completed spells, and you, you, you write down how long they took, and then you draw a histogram, and that's the density I'm talking about, F. Okay? There's another density that's relevant, which is walk into a store randomly, pick a good, and ask how old that price is. Write down that number. Pick another good, write down that number, and draw a histogram. Okay? And that's the, 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 the density of, uh, of ongoing prices, I'll call that. With Calvo, these are, densities are the same. But in general, they're not. Okay? In Taylor, they're very different, because in Taylor, um, the completed one has a mass at at the amount of time it took in zero density el elsewhere, um, but the ongoing one is like a uniform distribution. Okay? So that's just to warm up that they are different in general. Um, so here's the main result. The pass-through is basically this ratio using the different densities of how long it's been uh, since your price change. So S is how long it's been uh, since your price change, and omega is weighing you know, so that is an expectation of the duration using the omega versus using f in the denominator. Okay? So both are expectations of duration, so I'll call that d hat and d bar, which basically is saying it's the ratio of the ongoing duration to that expectation of the completed duration. Okay? Now, think of Calvo again. You, see, you can see through the le this lens. Here I've taken beta going to 1 to simplify. So which I said is an excellent approximation, and so I'm going to stick with that. So now with Calvo, we know those two durations are the same because the densities are the same. That's why we get phi of 1. But with Taylor, we know that you know, one duration is half of the other. 
Okay, the ongoing duration is half of the completed, and so we get a fee of a half. So that explains our previous two results of special cases. All right, but this is much more general. In the paper, I talk about how you could think of this empirically, taking into account there's heterogeneity and so on, and what, what to do, what not to do, and, and you know, I'm thinking more about that. <clears throat> but a very intuitive thing is that the ongoing, like, why, does, why do we get the completed duration in the denominator? That's just because one over the completed duration is the frequency of price changes. Now, why do we get ongoing in the numerator? That's intuitive. That's what firms care about. They care about you know, how old their price is going to be when they sell their good. And for that, you care about this ongoing uh, duration. Okay. So this isn't like fancy or anything. It's very simple and intuitive, I think. And I want you to note now, I could have noted it before, the frequency of price changes doesn't matter. What matters is the shape. So if you kind of double everything, all the durations, okay, so if I double the Taylor duration or I double the Calvo duration, I'm going to get the same fee. So frequency doesn't matter. Okay? So if we live in an environment where frequency is very high, or in other words, it's low, it's not going to change this pass-through. That's kind of an interesting result, I think. All right? And the intuition is frequency, when frequency gets higher, that makes inflation higher, you would think, if people have positive inflation expectations. On the other hand, they're going to overshoot by less because now they're, you know, they know their prices are going to be stuck so long. And the two things cancel. All right? And so that's why it doesn't matter what the frequency is. Okay, so this is uh, the biggest math I'll show you. Um, it's not that bad. This is a result saying, for a general time-dependent model, I can write this Phillips curve out. And what it is, um, is you're going to have, it's linearized, so it's a linear equation, obviously. Coefficients on the, on, on the expectations of inflation at all horizons. So now I'm not assuming inflation expectation is constant. It may be that we think inflation is going to be at 8% for a year, come down to 6% for another year, go back to, you know, to 2 after that or something. All right? So now you can feed those numbers in there, and there are, I give you a, a, a formula for those coefficients on future expectations. Um, let me talk about the second term, the second sum in a minute, okay? So what I can say about those coefficients is that they are positive. So obviously, higher inflation expectation always increases inflation. That's intuitive. And they're decreasing, um, and they go to zero, okay? Right? Actually, they go to zero quite fast. So you don't care at all about inflation ex expectations outside the range where your price is going to be fixed. So if you are a tailor and you're going to set a price in a year and a half or two or maybe in a year, you don't care about inflation in three years. Okay? That's just so intuitive. It, it's almost like I shouldn't be, have to say that. But I don't think that's kind of like how people talk. They talk about inflation expectations, long ones, long run inf inflation expectations mattering. Might matter for other reasons. But when it comes to how it impacts causally inflation, it, long run inflation expectations don't matter. Okay. The other sum is taking the sum of inflation in the past. So it's not expectations, it's the actual realized ones. And uh, these terms you can say are about inertia. So Calvo model does not have any of those past terms, but in general you do, okay, and you get inertia. And even though that's quite intuitive, I, there, no one has written this, this Phillips curve before. Okay, written this way. All right, and you get from a general time-dependent model, a model of inertia, which I think is kind of interesting, uh, much discussed in Latin America, structuralist, et cetera, views on inflation. But you, you get it from simple orthodox models, all right? Um, the other thing you get, which might make Friedman and others happy, is the Phillips curve is vertical. So if I add up both the, the, the inflation expectation terms and the past inflation terms, they add up to one. That means that I could be stuck at a, at a steady state with higher inflation. Uh, you know, you could be stuck at different steady states basically for any kind of output gaps and stuff. Remember, all the output gaps, real marginal costs are in the A. Okay? So even if A is zero, then there is you know, a, a, a continuum of you know, any inflation rate that's constant is a solution to this equation. All right? So that is kind of saying that we do have long-run neutrality. Right? 
And maybe I think that's why the people kind of want the inflation expectation to be one, because they kind of forget about the past one, and then they kind of want this wrong word neutrality. But I, I'm saying, like, you know, they add up, okay? Um, so it's all, it's all okay, all right? But it's still kind of, so this is saying, in terms of practical things, it's saying, so if inflation expectations go up kind of temporarily, maybe these fees are not that big and it won't matter that much. Um, that does, but now you do have to worry about the fact that later on we will have had inflation and that will persist. So it's, the message is not like a dovish message, inflation expectations don't matter uh, only, it's kind of saying they matter less than we thought, but the flip side is you can get inertia. So maybe now we really do want to control inflation so that we don't create an inertial process. Okay? And the inertia is not because, so often the inertia is discussed like in a, it's all because of expectations and expectations are inertial. Here I'm not doing that. It's, it's a, like intrinsic inertia. Could, could we wait for questions at the end or is it uh, clarifying? Because I'm, thank you. Yeah, so I can show you the formulas that are not here. They're not zero. Um, those, oh, lag, oh, no, lag the inflation expectations. No, those don't matter. So I've solved the model as a function of what actually happened. And now you don't need to know what those uh, expectations are. And that's very in the temporary equilibrium mindset. Okay. Now, I think some people look at this and say, that's trivial. You linearize. So yeah, you have some coefficients. No, I'm, I'm giving you properties about the coefficients. And I'm also telling you the things that don't enter. And also here, technically, and you will really know what I'm talking about, there's an invertibility question. Because the true state variable here is the, the, the vintage of, of past pri of prices. Okay? So this result is trivial if you think you can invert, based on past inflation, what that, what that distribution is of, past, of, of, of vintages of prices. And what I'm showing in the proof, the only heavy lifting part, is showing you can invert, okay? that you know, kind of you're in the you know, linear, outer regressive, the roots are in the right place, blah, blah, blah. Okay? And that's, that's a property of this hazard rate, you know, as a positive, and that does it, okay? All right, so, so the intuition for a fee decreasing, I think, is very intuitive also. So it matters more short term inflation than long term inflation. Why? Because it kind of hits you twice if, if you have inflation expectation today versus having it in the future. Yeah, five minutes, okay. All right, let me just highlight a very nice paper by Sheedy that uh, developed a, a Phipps curve. However, he developed it under rational expectations. So he can't, it's not the same one. And I think it's not as useful. And it has funny properties like, you know, like the fees are sometimes negative. And that's all because, you know, of the simultaneity of what's happening with expectations and output, right? Okay. I want to really uh, talk about this with my remaining time. So state-dependent models, what do they say? So here, let me start with uh, Shashinsky weiss simplest model. There's a constant inflation rate, and there's a cost of changing prices. So you're going to keep the price within some bands. So if you, if you take the difference between your price and the price index, uh, you're going to keep your, the x, that gap, between some bands. Okay. So when the price, as, as inflation, uh, you know, eats away your relative price, at some point it's too low, you, you, you reset it. Now, they studied a steady state. What I'm going to do is study, start at a steady state, but shock it by thinking of an inflation expectation change, okay? And the question then that hasn't been asked is, what do firms do in the short run? What happens? And here's very graphically, very intuitively what's happening. If you start at the steady state, you have a density of firms, that's like the omega before, uh, uh, distributed across this, uh, this, these, this, this price gap. And then when suddenly firms wake up and think, oh no, I think inflation expectations are 8%, not 2%, what happens is they should optimally widen their, their, their bands, okay? This was shown in Shashinsky Weiss. It's really what, the only thing they do is show that. And okay, so then, but then what happens is kind of funny. Nobody's changing their price now. So inflation expectations went up. Maybe we were living in a world with 5% inflation or in Argentina with 40. If they suddenly expect higher inflation, inflation goes down to zero. Okay? So I'm going to sum that up as fee being minus infinity. Okay? Um, it's not even differentiable, but yeah. All right. It's wacky. Okay? 
I'm going to try and change this in a minute, but let's follow the models first. Okay? Another model is Golos of Lucas. That model effectively adds a lot of idiosyncratic uncertainty, modeled in a very particular simplified way, and has really three numbers to describe the bands, an upper band, a lower band, and a midpoint you go to. And they focus on zero inflation steady states. Okay, or at least I will. And then there you get kind of the opposite. You get phi infinity. So this is very disconcerting, I agree, okay? Um, so these models, wow. All right, so what I'm gonna do real quick here is say these theoretical results are extreme, in part because I'm using continuous time and looking at the impact effect. And then they're very sensitive on impact, all right? So a little bit uh, uh, cheating on my, the spirit of only looking at impact effects, I'm gonna aggregate up a little bit over time, uh, but I'm not gonna go too far, I'll just do one quarter, so I think it's okay. All right, so I'm going to do that numerically, and I'm going to calibrate uh, citing the literature, okay? Here's what you get. So if you're in a world with zero inflation, you get the black line. And you can see there the golosov lucas result is that that slope initially was very high, almost infinity, like an anata condition, okay? But you see that it's not that relevant because immediately it starts looking like a slope of one, and you effectively end up very close to what Calvo was saying, a phi of one. So after a quarter, look at where the number is, it's close to one, okay? But if you do that with a more um, Shashinsky weiss mindset, without as much idiosyncratic uncertainty, or with higher inflation rates, steady state inflation rate, then you get something else. And I did this here just by adjusting the inflation rate. So. Uh, when I wrote this in Argentina, it was 40%. Now it's like 100, so I was motivated, you know. But I did that blue line there. And you see there that it goes negative initially, but then it comes back up, and it ends up somewhere near Taylor, like around 0.5, okay? All right. If I have two more minutes, I want to give you this last model in, in, in two slides. Because I think these models are interesting, state-dependent models, but I think they're also kind of crazy. All right? They were very interesting and sensible for steady states, but out of steady states, I would argue that firms are not reoptimizing their bands as soon as anything changes and doing something. So I'm going to approach this with this. Let me tell you the truth. I, my intuition is that firms have very simple rules of thumb. And they have, let's say, I'm going to keep my price plus 5 minus 5% from my ideal price, given my markup. Okay? And Here's the intuition. If, people, if firms are doing that, what is the pass-through of, of inflation expectation? Zero. It's, but it sounds like a very sensible policy, right, to have a plus-minus 5% rule. To me, it sounds very sensible because it's very robust. Whatever happens to inflation, my price I know is going to stay there. The way it's, it's not optimal is that now I might have to change prices more frequently than I wanted to and whatnot. But that seems like a... Weird thing to do in the short run to think that, imagine firms are really going to re-optimize that, in my view. So I'm going to model that instead of just saying that. But I think, to be honest, it's really kind of, I think, a thing we should think about. Okay? So I'll have two ideas there, but I'm going to skip one and give you the simplest model. I call it MC squared in honor of a famous equation. Um, and why? Because when people ask you, why is the menu cost reasonable? the cost of changing prices is trivial. And they're getting even smaller because I do it on the computer. People say, if you teach this stuff, you, you answer, no, 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 don't take it so literally. It's the cost of choosing the new price. The manager needs to go into a Zoom meeting. They argue forever. It's really boring. OK, manager time is really involved. But if, if that's the case, then when inflation expectations change, the managers are not going to get together and, and decide on new bands. Okay, so I'm going to model that by saying there's a CB in addition to a C. So C would be the cost of changing the price. CB is the cost of changing the, the, the bands. Okay, and I want you to think of a range, I think actually a bigger range, like 1 to 10 or something for that ratio because like a manager's time is really costly uh, compared to just putting one, one you know, sticker on that, menu, on that, um, on that soup. Um, but... Um, and, and the idea is you're going to keep up the old policy. So this is maybe the, the, the profit, discounted value of the profit of the firm if they were using the old bands. So the bands that were optimal for some inflation expectation they had yesterday. 
But you see that I'm also putting in the, the, the today's expectations there, pi e. And so that's the value they get with the wrong optimal, the, be, the ends that were optimal for yesterday's inflation expectation, but now their inflation expectations might not be the ones they had yesterday. So that's one value they get. And I want to compare that to the value they get if they optimize you know, uh, across uh, the new, new inflation expectation. And I'm going to say that they keep the old bands if this inequality holds. OK? All right. So if CB were 0, they always change their bands. But if CB is not 0, then they keep their bands. All right? And what I'm going to argue is very intuitive then. They'll keep their bands if the change in pi e is not too big. There's an inaction region now, but on the bands. Okay, that's why it's MC squared. Okay. All right. Okay. So it's menu cost and manager. So M and M. Okay. That's what. Yeah. Um, so there's this inaction region. And if inflation expectation moves within this inaction region, the pass through is zero. Okay. And you can show that this bands increase with CB, which is natural, but also the usual Yellen Mankiw insight that that the slope is infinity starting at zero. Okay. Because the envelope theorem, blah blah blah. Okay, so you could get a very big band with a small cost, theoretically speaking, but you know, let's do it numerically. So this is also calibrated, um, and basically, I'll highlight this point here. I like if manager if, if this cost of changing the bands is ten times the cost of changing the price, then you get a band that says you won't change the bands if the inflation expectations don't change more than twelve percent. Okay. All right, so I like that result too because it might say like if you, if you do something crazy, the value by 300%, like in Argentina, it creates a lot of inflation expectations, then you will get changes in the bands. But maybe if you're living in the US or Europe, maybe these bands won't change. Okay, so I'm, I'm com concluding. The results are that in time-dependent models, you can get this lower pass-through than one. I gave you these sufficient statistics to tell you very generally what they are and that short-run expectations are key. I also gave you this general Phillips curve. So kind of independently of this question, I like, there's a Phillips curve. I could retitle the paper like deriving the Phillips curve for a general time dependent model. Hadn't been done, surprisingly. State dependent model, you get extreme results, but adding frictions or aggregating, you get more reasonable ones. And I've tried to sell you the idea that it could be zero there with a little bit of a cost or behavioral you know, interpretation maybe of that cost. Actually, it comes back to, there's a paper by Akilorf that did this for money demand. And I discovered that later. It's a beautiful paper. He argued also very early on he was using these menu cost models. And he had a, 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 an argument that you wouldn't change the bands. OK, I discovered this later. John Cochrane told me about that. Um, so taking stock, I just think we should be more humble about what we think that pass through is. It might be a lot lower. But it's true there's a large uncertainty at this point. Um, it, and maybe as the latter results suggest, it might depend on the inflation rate or the size of the changes in expectations. And also bring back, I think, this idea of inflation inertia that sometimes gets a bad reputation. Thanks. So hi. Um, so Ivan presented the paper beautifully. I don't know if I have uh, that much uh, to add, but I'll try. I'll try to bring some intuition and to relate this to the policy questions uh, people were mentioning uh, yesterday. So. This is a, has a, a paper has a lot of Calvo elements. You have the staggered prices. You have people change their minds and there is a credibility issue. And then there is a difference between uh, levels versus rates. Um, so the question could be both considered economy with a staggered prices, it could be staggered because of a tailor type contracts, because of a Calvo ferry issues, or because there is a distribution of a markups in the menu cost model. So, the way, what happens if expectations change, or in the jargon, an anchor? Uh, so, he allows for, we have arbitrary expectations. And everybody's expectations change simultaneously here. You could think that maybe a fraction of the people change the expectation, a fraction not. And you take the average, but that's something that one could be explore. 
so I'm first to show a picture of how you do the prices when you think that inflation is going to be 2%, there is no uncertainty. So you want to have this relative price on average. This is a period. So you're going to put uh, your price 1% uh, above where you want to be. It's going to go to minus 1 after a year, with a period of a year for the 2%. And then you raise the price by 2%, and that goes on and on. Right? So the question here is, and here I'm expecting the 2%, and that's why you raise the price here 1%. Right? So now, um, I went here, and then all of a sudden my expectations are 4%. So if the expectations are 4%, I will raise the price by 2%, so that uh, when I have the 4% on average, I'm here, so that's uh, one half. But if Ivan doesn't like this, but I like it to motivate Ivan's uh, exercise. But if everybody got a shock to expectations, then this is going to up by, go up by 2%. Uh, so here, the price went 1% more than what it had to be. So the, if this goes up as well, then uh, everybody's going to raise it by 1%, so you're going to be 2% above. So the expectation went from 2 to 4, and uh, you raise this a little bit more, but then because this went up, the nominal price goes by more, and the pass-through is uh, 1. Okay. But then, that's when it, all the contracts are synchronized, and you don't have the staggered prices. Now, if not everybody changes the price, this is not going to go up and things uh, are going to be different. Now, there is also the issue of past inflation or a past inflation surprise. So you were doing 2%, you went here, but instead of, a, but instead of having 2%, you had a 3% inflation and you ended up in minus 2. So here, instead of raising the price by 2, you're going to raise the price by 3. So if uh, this is constant, then the past inflation is going to matter because now you have to raise the price by more to account for the fact that you are way off, okay? And now, Pierre Olivier yesterday showed, you could think of this as a, the price level and this as a, the wage, and the same logic applies. Uh, the union will want to have a, ma a, price, a, a wage that is high, so at on average, the real wage is what uh, you want to be. So, Peter Olivier yesterday showed that wages were doing this, so then we would expect wages to go up by 3% to go where you want to be, and then inflation would be normal. But then, of course, there are shifters, and this might have changed. So this makes the problem for the policymaker very different because you want to look at the wage increases like uh, Peter Lee was doing ye yesterday to try to understand what are expect if expectations are an anchor and so on. It's very hard to read that from the data because there are all these uh, things going on. And then, because this is about the credibility of current policies, um, people expect four, but the central bank might want to implement two. And if they do that, then the real, then the real, if you think of this as wages, the real wage will be too high. And then you have the recession, of course, that's uh, Barrow Gordon and time consistency, not in Ivan's paper, but maybe in this conference. So now, when you take account, uh, I'm all with, where you can have uh, staggered prices because that are exogenous, some might be tailored up contracts of duration N staggered one over N, the others could be Calvo or anything that is fixed, then you're going to have a formula that generalizes what uh, I just said. And Ivan explained this uh, beautifully. Um, 
Inflation is going to be an average of future inflation because when you make the pricing decision, you have to anticipate how much you want to overshoot. And that's going to depend on these uh, things that depend on the probability that the price spell that will last so many periods. And then it also depends on the realized past inflation because that's uh, telling you how far you are, how far down your relative price went because you didn't change. So this is going to depend on the this distribution of our firms of uh, how long the price spells were in the past. So then, uh, I'm going to try to explain the Golos of Lucas uh, result. So, here I missed, there should be lines here. So, what do you do when uh, you have the menu cost and some uh, idiosyncratic uh, shocks to firms? There is a distribution of markups that depends when you get to either this upper band or this lower band, you put the price here. So there is a whole bunch of firms in the middle and some that go to the, to the, to the bands because you're getting the idiosyncratic shocks. Here you're doing this for an initial steady state with a zero inflation. So you're here and then you increase inflation um, a little bit, so your initial markup is going to be higher because it's going to fall uh, faster. And because of the logic that uh, Jen, Jen explained, the bands are not going to change. So you move a little bit to the right, and then these mass of firms that are here are going to change the price. But if you're taking these derivatives, this is going to be like nothing. Uh, it's going to be very small because the mass of firms that are here is uh, small. Now, Ivan's proposal that I think is very interesting is say, is saying <laughs> there is this problem that they're monitoring uh, prices all the time, and then when they have to change the price and they have to decide this reset price, I have to think there is manager time, and that's costly. But it also makes sense in this spirit to, th to think. Moving these bands and having this new pricing policy might also be costly. So then we do the MC squared. And then unless the shock to expectations is really big, you don't move these ones. And then you change the expectation and nothing happens because there's an inaction region with uh, these bands. OK? So um, Taking stock. I think it's a really important stock uh, thought experiment to, to do this, to think about how a change in expectations is going to change the pricing decisions of firms in partial equilibrium. Now, um, you could ask as a policymaker, can I read decisions to try to see if how much credibility I have from, people say that when you want anchored expectations, you want the expectations of the price makers to be anchored. So then how do you read if that is the case or not? Uh, <laughs> it's very hard to identify. You have model uncertainty in all these models that we showed, the answer was different. <laughs> then there might be shifters in uh, the optimal markup or in relative prices because of oil shocks and whatnot. That makes these decisions harder to read. And then <laughs> if inflation was higher than, I, uh, than what I was uh, thinking then, uh, that might also matter. Um, so that's a related to Chris's question that you don't have the inflation or price of just inflation. Um, but maybe you were anticipating for that. I don't, it's probably inside these formulas, but I didn't see intuition that clearly. And uh, I think that this idea of changing the, of having the cost for changing the band and having an, an area in action region is a, a really interesting idea to explore more independently of this question. Uh, so, thanks. We have lunch. Yes. <laughs> but you ask us to ask about you the data.
You ask us to ask you about the data. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, I, I, I really, um, more a consumer when it comes to the empirical work, but I really looked at it. And um, I would love that there's at least some hints from the empirical literature. Uh, okay, maybe I put the slide up real quick because it helps. But basically, um, we know there was work on using kind of mag aggregate time series to estimate Phillips curves. That's very contentious. Um, we'll go right to the top. Oh, no, right to the end. Um, and where is this? See, I had a lot of slides I skipped. Uh, let me find, okay, here. Um, so in terms of the empirics, just quickly, time series, there was kind of the Gali gertler work. Um, came under fire by a bunch of people. Um, whatever you think of that, that was, even the empirical approach was imposing rational expectations. Kind of like GMM, as testing Euler, you know. So it, it just cannot get at the question. But also there's a huge range there of what they were thinking. Gali Gertler got a pretty big term on future inflation expectations, but not even one, okay? Although their interpretation was it's not one because the other people's expectations matter, but they're just not changing their expectation. So at least under that interpretation, they were still presuming it's one. Um, um, but yeah, there are people who say that that's, that work is, is wrong and you could get a, a lot lower number. But it has the usual problems we have in macro with identification. Um, and there's some nice work, I think, by a huge team, a lot of people, uh, Koibon, Gorichenko, et cetera, working on surveys. And there's some experimental or quasi-natural experiments um, that are being done. Bank of Italy's one. So they survey businesses, and then they randomly treat a few of them with the central bank's forecast. And then they can see, let's say half of them get central bank forecast and then half of them don't. Um, and then you can see what, what people, what, they, what their expectations were and how their pricing was exposed to. So they follow up and check what happened to employment, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, the Koibon paper really focused on employment. And I'm pulling this number by dividing one table by the other. They were not focusing on that. but. If you take their numbers at face value, they get a 0.2 number for fee, okay? Um, now there's some problems with that. Um, one problem is there's a, a paper saying that if you do it differently, you get zero. Uh, he's a David Card student. Um, and uh, who works at the Bank of Italy, actually. And, but another is, I think, something that, that, that makes these things difficult is that when you change expectations of inflation, you don't change expectations inflation of expectations only, you also are changing uh, GDP or what the interest rates are going to be, et cetera, because you might say, no, inflation expectation is higher than you think. And then they say, ah, then I think the Fed's going to react or whatever. Who knows? Um, so, or we're going to go into re you know, a recession because they always have it upside down. So there's a lot of issues with that. Okay, so some caveats. So bottom line is, <laughs> I kind of think uh, those caveats still are important, but it's it's very promising, this kind of work. Um, I think if you had two instruments, three instruments, three, enough experiments, then you can separate those things. Okay, they just have, you know, so they, they have a paper now with two instruments, but they don't do this. They do, do it to do mean and variance. So if you did that with two instruments and you did mean and output, inflation and output, you could maybe start getting at it. But it's, it's tricky, like I, I'd have to see it done, but uh, it's promising, yeah. And then my, uh, what, just let me add, I, you know, this is my, I bear my priors, I'll tell you the truth. I think in the U.S. inflation expectation had almost zero effect. Basically, I think firms are catching up on their price this is relative to marginal cost. And I think people who think otherwise should show me evidence of it. Uh, the, the firms are doing, basically this, thinking hard about, there's results in this paper, but it's also like deconstructing how things work is helpful. And it tells you, you need to find the overshoot. And I don't think people are sure, you know, so maybe there's a microeconomic way to go where you focus on this over. Ivan, yeah. we have two more questions, so, so let's okay, move so this, on. No, this is very impressive, but, y y you know, I, I find very interesting that th this is a very, like, extensive literature right now trying to measure expectations from microdata. You have two bullet points there on that, and then I'm wondering, I mean, Fed itself looks like 13 different set of expectations, ECB similarly, 
and this is a huge, huge business. So, and you know, there's like the one based through the options, financial market. I mean, you know, th th this is just, I don't know. I mean, like, you know, did you try to look at kind of deeper in that literature and calculate your phi based on that? So, because you said at the beginning of your presentation, you know, empirical evidence is not going to cut it. But, but I feel like this literature is like, you know, just started. I mean, there's like a lot now we can do. Yeah, to no, 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 I'm trying to say I'm, it's promising. Yeah, so let me answer. Okay. First of all, there's a huge literature and I didn't deny it. Most of it is just measurement. Then you get into interesting things like consumer expectation, firm expectation, investor expectation, which one matters. Ricardo Rice has interesting work on that. A bunch of people have interesting work on that. There's a lot of data sets on it. Getting to the kind of natural experiment that would tell you the answer to this question is much harder as usual, as we know, than just getting a bunch of data. And that's kind of my comment, that's all. Um, but it's promising, maybe we can get it. Um, yeah. Okay. The other question? Uh, I, I didn't hear anything about wages. I mean, wage expectations, wage push on prices. How does uh, the behavior of wages and wage expectations work into your model? Absolutely. So in this paper, I just look at a firm, and I talk about them having a different expectation for inflation. And I show that that doesn't necessarily... The simplest version of that is they just care about their marginal cost. And so then you should interpret what I'm saying is they have some expectation of wage inflation, let's say, okay, or other marginal cost inflation. But actually the results work even if they also care about their competitors' prices uh, through co strategic complementarities. In that case, what I'm doing is studying the change in expectations that's common to both wages and, and their competitors, okay, which I think makes a lot of sense because, again, I want to look at what happened to the no like the pure nominal side, okay? Um, now you could go deeper and say have strategic complementaries and study separately if they have expectations of inflation in their competitors versus inflation of their inputs and, and wages. And I haven't done that. That would be like breaking it up more. Um, yeah, and then on wages. So what I do think is everything I did is completely analogous if I look at wage setting through the usual lens. Um, you would just say that, for, that workers are trying to predict prices to see whether they want to work or not, and they do the usual thing. So, uh, but I do think there's a lot more interesting to say about kind of the wage price interactions, and I have a separate paper on that now with, um, I forget my co-author's name. <laughs> Sorry, Guido Lorenzoni. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's all about the firms care about the wages, the, w the, the wage cares about the prices, and how does that interact? Um, and there's a lot of other things there. So I, I, I agree that you know, we're not touching on all that. Ivan, I'm using a little bit on the, the time for lunch, but based on all this, which is incredibly interesting, what is your insight for what's happening in the US in terms of inflation? Yeah. What's the role of expectations? And you talk about the possibly relevance of long-term expectations and inflation. And uh, most central banks actually make the huge argument that inflations are anchored precisely because they look at the long-run expectations. Yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts on that. Not yeah, all Briefly, of, though, briefly. Yeah, no, so I won't go into long, and they're not as good as the paper. Like, I have to think of it more. It's a hard topic. I do think it's... I'm not saying central banks are wrong to look at long-run inflation expectations because... Um, for one thing, if inflation expectations, long-run inflation expectations are high, that means at some point, short-term expectations are going to be high. So they might be trying to prevent getting there, you know? So, um, so it's, I don't think it's irrational for central banks. I could explain why that, that still matters. What I'm trying to say is for the current inflation, it's very hard, I think, to say that long-run inflation expectations uh, have a direct impact on inflation. Uh, that's kind of the claim. Um, but in terms of the, what's going on with inflation in general, I have this prior I shared that, you know, it's mostly catch-up, and wages in particular are very behind uh, in, 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 on average. Uh, it's a lot of catch-up, not a lot of overshooting. Um, and that's my intuition. I could be wrong. Um, I don't think that's true necessarily once you go to 40% inflation after five years. So I'm not trying to be a naysayer that expectations never matter. Um, I think it's more delicate and we have to be more humble and subtle about the topic. That's kind of, my position has always been, 
we're kind of sometimes too pressed to have a final answer, and we don't have a good final answer, and we give one. Like, no, just admit don't, you know, that we don't know a lot. <laughs> okay, so that, I think inflation is very messy. I'm trying to study it in a series of papers from different angles, and my overall feeling is a complete sense of insecurity about it. <laughs> but that we're learning a lot, but often, obviously, policymakers have to make a choice. I'm not saying, but then don't, you know, we can't speak so loudly about our security, about a couple of sim oversimplified equations that have particular properties, and I'm trying to cast doubt on that. And I always give an analogy, and if I could finish with this one, is like, like in this paper, I end up with a wide range, and you might say, what did I learn? Like, I don't know what the fee is. Yeah, but that's learning too. So sometimes you had the wrong idea, and you were sure of something, and then what you learn is that you shouldn't be so sure. That's knowledge, okay? And I think we don't do enough of that in economics, impart knowledge in that form, because we feel like we gotta give a number. And this is not that kind of paper, and it's a little unsettling, but I think if an astronomer discovered a planet, they would be applauded for doing that, but they wouldn't immediately say, well, now tell me if I can live there, what's the atmosphere like? Like, they would answer, I don't know. That's science, we don't know yet. It'll take 30 years, we'll send a probe, maybe. But instead, like, you know, the version of economics is someone would Grab, go on TV for three minutes and say, I know that we can live there. And another one would say, I know we'll die if we go there. Um, and so that's an analogy that I think we have to be, you know, kind of think that knowledge, lack of knowledge is good. And, and I finished with one example. That's clearly true for humans. Like, a five-year-old is very secure about the wrong things. And in life, what they learn is that they mostly don't know those things that they thought they knew. And I think in economics, a lot of the, what we need to do is more of that. Thanks. Humility, great way to finish a session. Thank you.